and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is a man who loves calling werewolves wimps. Adam Hodgins. I, I call them a lot of things, but it always starts with wimps. I mean, that, all right. There are many great things about dog soldiers. There really are. And I'm not even using hyperbole. I love this movie. But when he no, calls so we, a werewolf a wimp, it made me so happy. So we need to preface this with we're going to say some things tonight. But nobody misunderstand. I love this movie. Like I, like I love it. It's maybe, it's so. Here's the thing, Mark. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what genre to put this into. Like if if you go to Blockbuster Video Store, does it yeah. go in action or horror? Do you think just because werewolves are in it, it goes to horror? Because Aliens was in horror. Yeah, but it's it's but it's, it's sci-fi. It's horror. It's action, but it, it skates the lines so well. And I'll say this. Usually, and let, let's call a spade a spade, this was made for like a sci-fi TV channel. Like this, that's what this is. This is a made-for-TV horror sci-fi movie. That's what it is. But it just surpasses all, you know, b like expectations. Well, yeah, everything he did. Like So Neil Marshall, the director, who also did Descent, which is my second favorite horror film of all time, he... Shot it in, in what, um, 16 millimeter, then blew it up to 35 so that they would have more budget for the werewolves. Right. Which is right. amazing. They went all the way to Luxembourg to film. I, I like they had, Their sets were scarce, but they were beautifully built. And they worked. It told the they, right story. Absolutely. So, I mean, but, oh, go what, for it. So what I'm saying, when the horror movie genre or a, like, so like, you know, the classic like a vampire or a werewolf or a mummy or a Frankenstein or a monster. Like when one of those horror genre classics crosses over with another genre. So you get like wrestling zombies or vampire strippers or when you get one of those crossover things, it's usually the worst. Terrible. It's usually like, OK, this is going to be bad. We're just phoning it in. This is good. We're going to go for it. it's so bad, it's good kind of way. But we're trying to do that, so it's not even credible to do that. Dog Soldiers kind of says it's going to do that, but then it's a fantastic movie. So good. So good. I mean, I can, so I have seven pages of notes on this movie because I went into a – everything I could find. I, I, I bought the Blu-ray that doesn't have the commentary, which is awesome, but – I just went through everything I could find, every interview, all the the stuff. I found Simon Bowles, the production designer's website, and oh, man. I learned how he built that. He, you know, he they built the the house right. in Luxembourg, but they just built the front facade and part of the left side of the the place, and then they had some areas where they could go through windows and a fake chimney, and then right. they built all the stages. But you know what I love about these stages is that they built them to withstand kicking and punching. And flopping and flipping and dipping, dodging, ducking, diving and dodging. Because so, yeah, like the, the, the five Ds. Yeah, the five, I mean this is a solid set. So they put a lot of thought behind the production design. And then Neil Marshall, like he did in the Descent, he hired actors to play the monsters, just yep. so that they would be more theatrical. And this one, he hired dancers to be the werewolves. And you can kind of see that in the way that they jump out of windows re backwards, and the way that they're like the, they, the way they crouch when they're going under things. And they're no, mean. Good. And these are mean werewolves. And that's like so, like, you know, Thirty Days of Night. I love the mean vampires. Right. It's I, not like it's not like oh, this is a curse, and I have to. I'll try to fight it. It's no, we're bad people that are luring you in, so when we turn to dogs, we can eat you. Exactly. They and they have bodies and, in their home, so they're not misunderstood either. Right. And and you can see that, like, when H.G. Wells turns into a werewolf at the end, because that's his name, Harrison yeah. G. Wells. I love it. That's, that's his name. Um, he's like a good werewolf who's trying, still trying to fight for the, for the good team, even when he's transitioning into werewolf. That's the one muddy thing for me in this movie, and that's why I like it. Now, why, is it why is it muddy? All right, so he, I'm going to preface why I love it first. Okay. All right. So as far as we know, vampires are not – or uh, werewolves are not real. As, as far, far as we know. As far as we know. So yeah. that means there's no rules. Yes. There isn't – there's nothing. There, You don't even need to explain your werewolves sometimes. Like, you, like It's like Looper when Bruce Bruce Willis is like, please don't explain this to me. Like, I don't, yeah, don't want to know. 
I'm not going to explain it to you, yeah. kid. I could care less. And this one, it's pretty interesting because I feel like these werewolves maybe lose their humanity when they become werewolves. But then right. certain... But I guess, like they said, you know, when you have to take a pee, you have to pee. But if you have to go, if you have to take a crap, you can hold it. So right. certain werewolves can hold it until they have to turn or when it's time, it's time. But I don't even think they lose their humanity completely because that one shot the gun and threw it back to the window. Yeah. And then the other one cheekily threw ahead. The other one waited in the car. So they're just jerks. Yeah. No, exactly. It's it's the personification of these these evil people. And I guess we do learn that there, you know, we learn about the family. We learn that there's an alpha pair and then a beta male. Right. So then we have them. So they just, they've killed 15 people. They know they've, they could lock themselves up. They're in that dungeon. Right. But they don't because they like it, Mark. Oh. Because they're, because they're bad people. Bad to the bone? They're bad dogs. <laughs> I'm bad surprised dogs. they didn't say that in this movie. They should have. There, there was a, you know what? I'll say this. In, in these genre-type horror – and again, this thing could have so easily went off the rails, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. There were so many puns just left on the table. So many. So many moments just left on the table where it might have been like, ha-ha, like cheeky joke. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. They played it – he played it so earnestly. All the jokes that were said were jokes that military guys in that moment would try and make to cut the tension mm -hmm. of like, we are fighting werewolves right now. Um, but there was there wasn't like the Bubba Hotep tongue in cheek humor. Uh, there was the one guy who made the joke. He pulled a Samuel L. Jackson, mm -hmm. and he so instead you know remember Samuel Jackson gets so into his speech he gets eaten by a shark because he forgets he's standing by water. Right. And this one, one of the I'll get let me pull up his name. So let's see, ripped out of the window, Terry. Terry right. after shooting all the werewolves, he says, "Uh, dogs." A werewolves, more like, you know, wimps, right. another word. Right, right. But he's so into his joke, he gets ripped out of a window. Right. Did you like that? So I didn't not like it. Got it. Because, I again, I think in those moments, that felt like an earnest joke to me. Like, I felt like that's a joke that someone would actually make. Yeah, you're right. And, uh, you know, these are roughneck soldiers out in the middle of nowhere fighting werewolves. I'm also going to say they're, like, British. So they have like a different cheeky sense of humor than we do. Yeah. And I right. guess he's calling, he could be calling them cats. Well, no, he's not, but, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and that's fine. It's just, so I think to why this movie was so beloved to me was right from the first shot, everything felt otherworldly because again, you don't see many werewolf movies set with like a, with like Scottish soldiers. <laughs> yeah. You're right. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's, you know, I, I don't know. It just, it just felt, other, but there were still horror tropes in it, but they did them differently. My favorite gag in the movie was at the very beginning when the two people were making out in the tent, and he's undoing her zipper. Oh, that's so good. And then the zipper sound just keeps going, and then the, the wolf comes into the tent. <laughs> Loved that. Thought that was. I thought right away. I was like, oh, I'm in. I'm in on this. I mean, that's so inspired. Take, take me for the ride. Now, how happy are you that I love that it was Kevin McKidd in this and not Jason Statham as Cooper? Yes, 100%. 100%. Jason Statham in this would have felt like a spinoff of In the Name of the King. Yeah. Like, I, I think he would have, I think he would have done it in that, in that vein. Because remember, this is 2002 when this came out. Yeah. So he was just, just, had Transporter come out yet? No, was, but he, he was hot off of, like, what, Snatch was 2000. Right. So he was pretty hot on, well, no, you know what, Transporter was around this time. Yeah, I would say Transporter was probably 2002, 2003. But he didn't do this movie because he wanted to do Ghosts of Mars. Right. And I just think that if he did this movie with the budget, he would have just had fun with it. He would have said, oh, I'm just going to go in there and do and just be, be as charming as I can. And this one, McKid is kind of... McKid is trying trying to become the... Like, he wants to win an Oscar for this movie. Yeah! He, dude, he puts it all in there, doesn't he? Nobody phones it in. Putri, yeah. is, Putri is great. Cunningham's great. They're all fantastic. Man. Pertree should should have gotten an Oscar Best Supporting Actor Academy Award nomination for the story he tells about the tattoo of the devil on the guy's butt. That or the scene where he's like, knock me out, and then he gets punched, and yeah. he's not knocked out yet. He comes back, and he's like, I love you. I love you. Like, yeah. <laughs> that, that whole scene was brilliant. And it's in an action movie with 
horror sci-fi element. So like we said in Universal Soldier and Dolph Lundgren, that was a great monologue he delivered. Absolutely. Out of nowhere. So good. Hey, can I yeah. drop some things on you real quick? I want you to. All right. So I went through a ton of lists and I looked at best werewolf movie with lists just to kind of see where this would end up. And I kind of want to see what you think about it. All right. Okay. Bloody Disgusting says it's the sixth best, best werewolf movie ever. Okay. Now, bear in mind, American Werewolf in London is the consensus number one. Ginger Snaps is always in the top three as well. Right. Num it's number two on Collider's list. Number two? Yeah. It's number four on Pace list. It's number six in Den of Geeks list. It's number four on Ranker. Now, I was reading some articles, and they said that it was the... This werewolf is the second most powerful werewolf after the werewolves in Underworld. Right. How do you feel about that? So I would say it's in my my top if, – if I had to make a, a list, it, I would say it's in the top three werewolf movies for me. Um, and again, American Werewolf I, – I would agree with American Werewolf in London as the, kind of the quintessential um, werewolf movie. And then I'd probably say this is number two, and then the original like universal werewolf movie would be probably three just because it's, it's got the like OG clout. Yeah. I like that. But as far as the most powerful werewolves, um, wh which ones are more powerful than these ones? Because these ones are like, these ones are shooting guns. These ones are busting through walls. The, these ones are they got the Gigantor ones in Underworld, the one that's ah. the size of the creatures from Rampage, and all it does okay. is throw people long distances instead of you know squishing them. Do you think Underworld just kind of should have been a one a one shot movie? No, because I like – all right, so the first one's obviously the best. The rest of them go downhill. But I like that they kept kept uh, Rona Mitra or Kate Beckinsale in the lead, right? You just got these, I don't know, female butt kickers. You, that's really so rare. I like I liked the one without Beckinsale the best. Yeah, I, well, I mean, Bill Nye, Michael Sheen, Rona Mitra. That's a – all right, for a prequel third in the series to have the cast they did, I mean, that's impressive. Yeah, they really pulled off a magic trick with that one. It's it's better – I remember – all right, so this sounds weird. I try to really not let expectations get in the way. But the first right. time I watched Underworld Rise of the Lycans, I kind of thought, this isn't terrible. Which the second one I watched and I went, whoa, this is this is not good. This is no. – uh, no, run away. There's a, yes. like, there's a 10-minute scene where they're covering windows with paint in the second yeah. Underworld. No, the first Underworld movie I was super about. I was like, this is great. It's kind of genre-specific. Beckinsale was like dynamite. And then like the – yeah, I thought, it, I thought it was great. And then like the, the hybrid at the end coming through, it was beautiful. Then they stole Equilibrium's face-cutting gag. Yeah. I like that. Um, but when the second one came out, it was such a fall from grace, I thought. So bad. So then I was just like, I wonder if this would have been better just as a standalone. I'm, I'm conflicted with that, Mark, because sometimes you see a movie and it's so good where you're like – all you do is you crave more. But she also don't want them to ruin it by doing more. And I'm yeah. gonna say I'm gonna say this, and I think stop me if if you think I'm speaking out of turn here. But for guys of our uh, age, our prestige, our our prestige. demographic <laughs> prestige, the first Mortal Kombat movie was dynamite. Oh, I mean, what we were what 13? It was 95 maybe. So I was 13 yeah. when I saw it, and I thought it like. So it's kind of crazy. Like during this time, I was watching Pulp Fiction, all that. But when I sat down and watched Mortal Kombat, I loved it. And and we loved the games. And then this movie came out, and it was like the first video game based movie that wasn't awful. And it was actually pretty fantastic. And then all we wanted was more. And there was all kinds of more material because more video games had come out, and there's more characters. And that second movie was near unwatchable. Like yeah, I mean just the the weird werewolf. There's a very odd sex scene in it that's almost tougher than the one we did in Young Blood that we thought that really randomly talked around. Yes. It's, it, I, it's it's just a weird movie where it starts off so fast, right? Yeah. And then it just slows down so they can throw paint on a window for ten minutes, and I don't yeah. even remember the end. No, I think I think it's raining, and I 